all of us, Blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, everyone is critical if we as Americans are, have any chance, I think, um, of bridging our racial dis divide. So I'm gonna get started. And oddly enough, as life would have it, um, the story of my journey begins with Michelle Obama. As I mentioned, I, I started my career as a journalist. I, I spent nearly 30 years as a full-time journalist, 22 of those years at the New York Times. And during that time, I did all the things that correspondents do. I worked overseas in places like Russia and Cuba and Guatemala, and Northern Ireland and London, and all across Southern Africa, where I was the Johannesburg bureau chief for the New York Times. I spent a decade in Washington, chasing down senators in the Capitol and candidates on the presidential campaign trail in Iowa, flew on Air Force One, interviewed foreign leaders, covered floods and hurricanes and the great and ordinary story, stories of New York City. So all of those things. But in the winter of 2008, uh, the editors of the New York Times asked me to do something completely different. They asked me to spend the following year covering the incoming first lady, Michelle Obama, the nation's first African-American first lady. And this was something of an unusual request because the first family and the first lady are typically covered by White House correspondents, you know, who spend their time on Air Force One chasing the president around the briefing room, um, you know, working on policy primarily and, and the family, first family when they have time. Um, but there was a sense after that election in 2008, um, and not just at the New York Times, but at a lot of media organizations that we might want to do things differently this time. There was a sense that this family, this first African-American family in this house, this white house built in part with slave labor was going to be written about for generations to come. And we newspapers often like to think of ourselves as writing the first draft of history. So when my editors came to me and said, hey, you know, would you cover Michelle Obama? I said, sure. Um, and, and the seeds of this intellectual journey that I've been on, you know, started germinating uh, right away. Um, a few weeks before uh, the Obama's first inauguration, a colleague of mine, was working on a story about the president, the new coming, incoming president and his rainbow family. And she realized that we actually didn't know very much about Michelle Obama and her family. And so she asked a genealogist to do a little bit of digging. Um, but as journalists are want to do, you know, we didn't give the genealogist very much time. Um, and, you know, time ran out and uh, the genealogist didn't come up um, with much uh, in the short period of time that she had. And so the story ended up being about the president and his rainbow family, with just like a snippet of stuff about Mrs. Obama. And we thought that was that. But unbeknownst to us, the genealogist kept digging and digging and digging. And in the fall of that first year that the Obamas were in the White House, she called us back and she said, you know, I have stumbled across something really fascinating. Would you guys be interested? We were interested. And so I got on a plane and I flew out to Birmingham, Alabama. And I knocked on doors. I spent time in the archives. I went to courthouse basements, looking at records, trying to speak to anyone who might know anything about a man by the name of Dolphus Shields. He was the first lady's great, great grandfather and he was biracial. And the story that I wrote ended up being about his parents, the first lady's great, great, great grandmother, who was an enslaved girl named Melvinia, who was valued at about $450 in the 1850s, and her great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. So this was a front page story. It was news to the first lady herself. Um, it was discussed in the White House briefing room. Um, you know, it was um, it was an extraordinary um, feeling, you know, for for me at the time. And a couple of days after the story ran, um, I got an email from an editor at a publishing house saying, "Hey, you know, that looked great. Um, it was a little snippet of the first lady's family tree. Um, what about a book about the whole thing?" 
And I have to confess that my first reaction was absolutely not. You know, I have kids, I have a mortgage, you know, what, how am I going to even swing something like that? Um, and it's my great fortune that my husband said, wait, 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 wait a minute. Um, and he reminded me of a story that I had told him when I first came back um, from Birmingham. I had told him about a trip I had taken to Shadow Lawn Memorial Cemetery, where the First Lady's great-great-grandfather, Dolphus Shields, was buried. I wanted to try and find his tombstone. And I'm a journalist, and I was ready. I had been in the archives. I had found the records. I knew what plot, what row. I knew who was buried next to him. I had it all laid out in a nice manila folder. Um, and then I drove my rental car over to Shadow Lawn Memorial Cemetery and I stepped out and realized I wasn't ready at all. Shadow Lawn Memorial Cemetery was an old, neglected African-American cemetery. And for those of you who are familiar with the South um, at the time, um, Jim Crow South, when this cemetery was established, you may know that in the South, even the dead were segregated. So I walked through this place with the grass up to my knees, tombstones toppled. I spent the entire afternoon there completely unsuccessful <laughs> um, and didn't find his tombstone. But what I found was something I had never experienced before. It was a profound feeling like there was nothing I'd rather be doing than digging in the nation's history in that way. And my husband reminded me of that. And so I said, okay, you know, I think I'm gonna say yes. And so I did. Um, and for that book, I traveled all across the country. Mrs. Obama's enslaved ancestors were scattered all across the South in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and what I learned as I poured over 19th century records in courthouses and archives and historical societies was that her story um, reflected not only her family story and the story of her ancestors, um, but the story of America, the story of American slavery. But some of that story was very different from what I had learned in school. Mrs. Obama's ancestors in South Carolina, for instance, led me to an aspect of slavery that I simply had never known about. Her great grandmother on her father's side, the name was Rosella Cohen. Cohen, my first thought was, does the first lady have Jewish ancestry? My second thought was, but were there even slaveholders in the Jewish community? Well, it turned out that Mrs. Obama's paternal ancestors appeared to have an intriguing connection to one of the oldest and most distinguished Jewish families in Georgetown, South Carolina, who happened to be wealthy slave owners. Moses Cohen, who emigrated from London to South Carolina around 1750, was the first chief rabbi of Charleston's congregation of Beth Elohim, the birthplace of Reformed Judaism. And his two sons, Abraham and Solomon, moved to Georgetown and they became deeply involved in civic and political life. Abraham, who fought in the Revolutionary War and served as the town's postmaster, met with George Washington in 1791. And Solomon was a director of the Bank of the State of South Carolina. And his son, Solomon Jr., was elected to the state Senate in 1930. The family was so prominent that its weddings, funerals, and family happenings were often chronicled in local newspapers. And so really, it should come as no surprise then that the Coens also owned plantations and slaves. Solomon Sr. owned 24 enslaved people in 1810. His son Jacob owned 302 people in 1830. In fact, 83% of the Jewish residents in Charleston owned slaves in 1830, um, according to an article that I'm sharing with everyone. Uh, most of the Coens eventually left Georgetown, South Carolina for Charleston, but before they did, it is likely that one of the members of this prominent Jewish family owned ancestors of the first black first lady. And the surprises didn't stop there. I, I found additional surprises when I started researching the family that owned Melvinia. 
when we think about slavery, we often think, at least I did anyway, about the grand manor, the rolling lawn, you know, um, the gone with the wind kind of slavery, hundreds of enslaved people. But in Clayton County, Georgia, where Melvinia was enslaved, there was none of that. No grand manor, no rolling lawn. <laughs> Melvinia grew up on a farm where she was one of only three enslaved people in a place where white men worked alongside their enslaved people. Once again, this was a landscape of American slavery that I was completely unfamiliar with. Many of the modern day descendants of that slave owner who owned Melvinia were also unfamiliar with this history. They had no idea that their family had owned human property. And I tracked down the descendants of that slave owner because I was determined to try to identify the white ancestors in her family tree. And I suspected that they might be members of that striving Southern family in Georgia. So I tracked down those descendants and they were scattered across the South, some still in Georgia, some in Virginia, some in South Carolina. And you can imagine what it might be like to have a New York Times reporter knock on your door or call you on the phone and tell you that your ancestors had owned members of the First Lady's family, or even worse, that um, members of your family may have violated or raped a member of the First Lady's family. Many of us might like a connection to the White House, but I have to say that's not the one that most of us are looking for. So some people hung up on me, refused to talk to me, wanted nothing to do with me. But others shared their stories, their records, their photos, and their DNA. Many of us African-Americans know that we have white ancestors in our family trees, but that's all we know. And so to solve this 19th century mystery in Mrs. Obama's family, um, I used 21st century science, DNA testing to identify them. And it turned out to be the most ordinary of American stories. The father of Melvinia's son was a member of the family that owned her. And the first lady of the United States had a whole constellation of white distant cousins all across the South who were suddenly grappling with their ties to this painful period of American history. So again, a powerful story, yet the most common of American stories. But it was also for me extraordinarily illuminating. All of this was beginning to show me that the economic benefits of slavery extended beyond what I had been taught as a girl. My research into Mrs. Obama's family taught me that there were slaveholders in the Jewish community among Native Americans and among a group of people that we often don't think about, small white farmers who inherited or managed to buy or rent one or two people and worked alongside them. It began to show me that the benefits of slave labor extended more broadly than I had imagined. I wrote my first book about this, American Tapestry, uh, which was published in 2012. And by then I was completely hooked on history and on this kind of research. But I was still a journalist writing for a newspaper and I had to go back to work. And when my editor came to me and asked me, what was I bringing back to the New York Times after this time away, all of this research, I said, a deeper understanding of 19th century American slavery and reconstruction. And honestly, we both laughed because it seemed so irrelevant to day-to-day -day American newspapering. But it turned out that it wasn't irrelevant at all. Um, I was called in when Dylan Roof attacked a black church in Charleston. And I could write about the long history of attacks on black churches that began after the Civil War. I was also tapped to work on a project um, that mined the New York Times photo archives for unpublished histories of important moments um, from black history that have languished unseen for decades. And that became the basis of my second book. And then in January of 2016, I got an email from a colleague who wrote for Business Day, which is, as many of you know, the business section for the New York Times. 
The CEO of a tech company in Cambridge, Massachusetts sent her an email. He was pitching a story about slaves and Georgetown University, and he wanted to give the Times an exclusive. And my colleague looked at this email and thought, what in the world, like a story about slaves sold in 1838? Was that even a story? Um, and I'm, I'm really, truly lucky that she didn't just delete that email. And she didn't delete that email because she remembered there was someone on the staff who might have a sense of whether there was a story to be done. And she contacted me because she knew about my investigation into Mrs. Obama's ancestry. So as you know now, in my book about Mrs. Obama, I had examined how contemporary families, black and white, ordinary and famous, have their origins in this painful period of American bondage. I used the lens of the First Lady's ancestors who had journeyed from slavery to the White House in five generations. This story about Georgetown was so exciting to me because it seemed like I had finally found it, um, a way to push this research of mine um, that I was kind of doing alongside my newspaper work um, to um, another level. I had focused on how slavery shaped American families and I could see that this line of reporting would allow me to examine how slavery fueled the economy and the growth of some of our most prominent institutions. The CEO's email told me something I didn't know, that the Jesuit priests who had founded Georgetown were also slaveholders, among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. And in 1838, when it looked like Georgetown might face bankruptcy, they did what people do sometimes when they face financial troubles. They sell off their assets. And in this instance, those assets happen to be human beings. And so the nation's most prominent Jesuit priests sold more than 272 enslaved men, women, and children in a desperate bid to raise money to ensure the survival of the only Catholic institution of higher learning at the time, this college we now know as Georgetown University. The priests were successful. The profits from the sale helped to save the college from financial ruin, allowing it to develop in one of our elite universities. But that success came at a terrible, terrible cost. And I wanna take you back for just a minute to give you a sense of what that sale was like. And for that, we have to go back to November of 1838 in Alexandria, Virginia, not far from what we know of the nation's capital today. And if you had been standing there near the wharf that day, you would have seen them, scores of people loaded on a ship, forcibly loaded, there were elderly people, husbands and wives, children, babies. You would have seen the crush of the crowd, frantic people clinging to their children, babies wailing. Eyewitnesses describe people weeping, falling to their knees, begging for mercy. They were enslaved African-Americans and they were being sold and shipped down south far from the people they loved and the world they knew. And for more than a century, they were almost completely forgotten. Was this a story? I knew immediately it was a story. The sale involved more than 272 enslaved people. I wanted to tell the story of one. You know, I think we often think about the enslaved and enslavers and slave owners as faceless, nameless people from so long ago. And what I have found is that while it is difficult, you know, unearthing these stories, it's not impossible. And so what I did was I told the story of a 13 year old boy named Cornelius who was baptized by the priests and then torn from everything he knew when he was sold and shipped to Louisiana. And I told the story of his descendants who are still Catholic and still have ties to the tiny town where he was enslaved and died. I went to that town and to the graveyard where he was buried. And this time I found the tombstone. The story ran in 2016, April, 2016, and it received an extraordinary response. More than a million people read the story online 
and it was shared 14,000 times on Facebook. It made me realize something. Um, I wasn't the only one hungry for this history of ours. I wasn't the only one asking. Priests owned and sold slaves? Why didn't I know that? A university owes its existence to a slave sale? Why didn't I know that? And that question continues to haunt me as I dug deeper. As um, Virginia mentioned, I'm working on a book now about Georgetown and its ties to slavery. But as I've dug deeper, I've realized that there's no way to look at Georgetown without also looking more deeply at the Catholic Church. The first story that I wrote was about a slave sale in 1838. But the Jesuits who arrived in Maryland in 1634 owned slaves for more than a century before the 1838 sale. And they relied on enslaved labor and the profits from their Maryland plantations to finance their livelihoods, um, their missionary projects, including Georgetown. And the Jesuits weren't the only ones. Last summer, I wrote a story about the Catholic nuns who owned, bought, and sold enslaved people. Catholic nuns! This was also astounding, though a little less astonishing now. I gotta say, I'm getting a little harder to shake these days. But by the late 1820s, nearly all of the Catholic orders of nuns in the United States were slaveholders. The Georgetown Visitation Sisters in Washington, DC owned at least 107 enslaved men, women, and children, the records show. And they sold dozens of those people to pay debts and to help finance the expansion of their school and the construction of a new chapel. Here's a quote, nothing else to do than dispose of a family of Negroes. That was Mother Agnes Brent, the convent superior, writing in 1821, as she approved the sale of a couple and their two young children. The enslaved woman was just days away from giving birth to her third child. The Catholic church relied extensively on slave labor to grow and to flourish and to expand. And I didn't know that. I'm black and I'm Catholic and I didn't know that. Most Americans don't know that. Enslaved people have largely been left out of the origin story that the Catholic church traditionally tells about itself. Um, we think about the Catholic church as a Northern church, usually as an immigrant church. And that's certainly an important part of the Catholic church history. But in the early decades of the American Republic, the Catholic church established its foothold in the South in communities where slaveholding was considered a mark of wealth and prestige for parishioners and for clergy and nuns. So it wasn't unusual for American born priests and nuns to grow up in slaveholding families and many orders relied on slave labor. And you know, it's not just Georgetown, it's not just the Catholic church. Um, the list of contemporary institution with roots in slavery is long. There are other universities, not just Georgetown, Harvard, Princeton, some of the nation's biggest companies, um, largest insurance companies generated business from slave insurance, including New York, Life, and Aetna. Mind you, right? Not just Southern places, right? Some of our best known banks absorbed, banks absorbed by JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo allowed Southerners seeking loans to use their slaves as collateral and took possession of some of them when their owners defaulted. And since my first story about J Georgetown was published, more and more institutions are reckoning with this question. What does slavery have to do with us? And for the first time, many are looking at their histories and taking action. Um, my story, when I wrote my story, there were only a handful of descendants um, who had been tied to that sale in 1838. There are hundreds now. And in 2016, one of the first things that Georgetown did was offer legacy status and admission to any of the descendants who were able and interested to go in, in going to Georgetown um, for college or graduate studies. And last year, um, they created a reparations fund, what I would call a reparations fund, they call it something else. Um, they've committed to raising $400,000 a year um, and to using that fund for projects that will benefit uh, the descendants. 
The Virginia Theological Seminary, one of the oldest Episcopal seminaries, uh, created a $1.7 million reparations fund too, um, in acknowledgement of having benefited from slave labor. Um, the Catholic nuns around the country are history and grappling with it. Um, some are building memorials. One order posted their records online so that people could find their families in their history. One order has established a reparation scholarship fund. All of this is, has been just amazing to watch. But I still circle back to that question that I had when I first started digging into Michelle Obama's enslaved ancestors and learned that this landscape of slavery was so different from what I had studied in school. I've learned now so many things that I've shared with you um, and, and so many things that I didn't know. And I, I keep asking myself, why don't we know? Um, sometimes you have clues of why we don't know. At Georgetown Visitation School, an elite school, girl school in Washington, which was founded by those slave-holding nuns, they have a website. And until two years ago, the history page of that website did not describe slaveholding. Instead, it praised the nuns who established their elite academy and a Sunday Saturday school free to any young girl who wished to learn, including slaves, at a time when public schools were almost non-existent and teaching slaves to read was illegal. Now, that was until 2017. And then uh, the school hired an archivist who found that nothing that supported um, that any record that supported um, the notion that the nuns had educated enslaved girls. Instead, she found records showing that the nuns had sold dozens of people, including children. But the history section of that school's website told a different story, an incorrect story. So these days, I think a lot about public memory, about what we know about ourselves as a nation and what we forget and what we sometimes choose to forget. And one of the things that I think that we've chosen for a long time to look away from is this history of slavery and how foundational it was to so many of our families and our institutions. Whether intentional or unintentional, this disconnect prevents us from understanding what I've learned, which is just how foundational slavery was and is. This is painful history, hard history because it sits uncomfortably with the narrative that we embrace as Americans. This narrative of freedom, equality, justice for all, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with all of that. But at the same time, it's critical history. It's critical to understand that slavery involved more than just the South and that more than just history. It was an economic engine that powered the growth of our economy and many of our most powerful contemporary institutions. And it was the root that spawned generations of discrimination and enormous inequality. And it lives with us, all of us now. We're in February, right? But this is not just black history. This is American history, our history. And whether your ancestors were enslaved or slaveholders or not, this is an important but uncomfortable reality to wrestle with because the truth is whether your ancestors arrived in 1840 or 1950. White people, even immigrants, benefited from slavery's legacy. They benefited from Jim Crow's and segregation, an entrenched system that privileged white people, that reserved for them the best schools, the best jobs, the housing, and access to government benefits while effectively and actively uh, marginalizing, disenfranchising, and discriminating against Black people. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, from more recent times, um, which I think is helpful when we think about kind of how slavery is related to who we are. So slavery ended, uh, Reconstruction um, emerged and ended too, right, was rolled back. Jim Crow emerged. And I'm gonna bring you some examples from the 1930s, um, the New Deal, 
which benefited so many Americans, right? But which was very much shaped by this system that emerged from slavery, the system of Jim Crow and segregation. So I wanna start with the Federal Housing Administration. Any economists will tell you that home ownership is the most powerful way for working class and middle class people to build wealth and pass it on to the next generation, right? And the newly created Federal Housing Administration made home ownership and the wealth that came with it widely available to Americans, the masses for the first time. Um, it created low interest loans and the 30 year mortgage, which we all know today. Um, home ownership, you, you, we all know about the post war boom, right? Home ownership went from less than 30% to almost 70%. Um, but who benefited? Who benefited and who didn't? Um, Black people were almost completely shut out of that. Um, FHH loans went almost entirely to people in predominantly white neighborhoods, not to people in mostly black areas. Generally, the only places that black people were allowed to live. And what was the result? The overwhelming majority of those loans were steered away um, from African-Americans. Another example, and I'm checking my watch. I wanna make sure I've got some photos for you, so I wanna make sure I have enough time for that. Social security, another one, um, which helps all Americans now, but when it was first created in the 1930s, it, it excluded domestic and agricultural workers who of course were disproportionately people of color. Um, two thirds of all African-American workers were blocked from social security until the program expanded in the 1950s. So, this is this is this is hard history is what I um, often describe this as when I when I talk about it, and um, Americans I think we are as a people often reluctant. One of our strengths is the looking forward, right? Is the keeping moving? Um, is the striving? Is that kind of um, focus on advancement? Um, we don't always like to look back in the rear view mirror, but I think it's really, really important for us to do that so that we can have an understanding. Um, I think in order to understand uh, who we are and where we are going, we need to know where we've been. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up um, that, the talking, talking part of my presentation. Um, share some photos with you. And then what I'm really looking forward to because um, mostly I, I love talking to folks, is um, to answer some of your questions. But let me share a few photos with you before we do that. And um, I hope you will have um, a little bit of forbearance with me and my technical stuff here. I'm going to share my screen with you so that I can show you some photos. And let's see if we can do this. It's going to give you my presenter screen, and then I'm going to get it going. Okay. Oops, sorry, that's you. You can click play from start all the way on. Uh, see, is that where I thank that's you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. All right, so this is Georgetown. Um, if any of you haven't seen it, it's, it's really um, beautiful as you can see. Um, this is the first story that I wrote um, about um, that sale in 1838 um, and the people who were sold to keep Georgetown afloat. I mentioned to you um, that I focused the story on a boy uh, who was sold. Uh, I felt like, again, you know, we feel like slaves and slave people just too big but a kid um and i traced his journey um to louisiana um and to maxine crump um his descendant who learned his family story um from our reporting after the story ran um you know we posted um all of the information that we had 
um, and asked people. We actually partnered with Ancestry.com, you know, the genealogical site, just to get the word out. And we said, you know, do you have ties to this um, slave sale? We had a passenger manifest with names, um, first and last names, and scores of people wrote to us, and we were able to share some of their stories. Um, and and these are people who learned or tied to this history. And one of the things that's so remarkable is that um, many, 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 most of these families are still Catholic to this day. Um, this is another um, story that I'm sharing with the group. I mentioned that, you know, it's not just Georgetown, it's not just the Catholic Church. Um, and this was a story that I wrote about New York Life. Um, the major insurance company, which um, got its start generating business um, from slave insurance, um, which was kind of like if how we insure your car, you insure your car, or you don't want something to happen if it gets damaged, you can uh, file a claim, um, get some money back. Um, slave owners were concerned about that with the human property that they owned. Um, and so they ensured the lives of their people, so if injured or killed, um, they could recoup some benefits. And I used these records and, and traced um, one of uh, the descendants of one of the people whose lives were insured um, down into Virginia. All right, that's another picture of New York life. I'm gonna skip through here. And then these last photos are of Mrs. Obama's family. This is Mrs. Obama's first family. Um, that's Mrs. Obama as a baby with her mom and her dad and her brother. Um, and um, the story of Melvinia, uh, the first lady's great, great, great grandmother was her mother's line. Um, Dolphus Shields, you'll remember the first lady's great, great grandfather who was biracial, the one in Birmingham. Um, he is the gentleman, the older gentleman on the left. And I mentioned to you that some of um, the descendants of the slave owner who owned Melvinia um, were unwilling to talk to me, but some were. And um, this is Joan Triple, uh, a descendant of those slave owners who shared her stories um, and her DNA. And after actually my uh, book was published, I finally found um, a photo of some of these family members who owned Melvinia. Melvinia was owned by the older gentleman who is seated uh, with a long beard. Um, she was, um, he inherited her, uh, his, his wife, the older woman with the kerchief had a wealthy father. And when he died, um, he um, bequeathed her three people, including Mrs. Obama's great, great, great grandmother. Um, and the DNA testing suggested that um, the man who looks a little better than everyone else, um, it's, uh, with, it's looking a little bit away with the mustache, uh, was uh, the closest match. Um, so DNA is tricky, but um, he was the closest match. So um, the father of Dolphus was in this family um, and he was the closest match. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing uh, my screen and um, looking forward to hearing from you and um, taking any questions you might have. Thank you so much. That was so interesting and just such a compelling way of communicating a lot of information. Um, we have a lot of questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so I wanted to first begin by asking you one of our participants questions. Um, in your research, have you encountered any institutions that um, resisted owning slaves even when surrounded by people who considered it quote unquote normal? That is an excellent question. Um, and I and the answer is I no, but I think that's not because they didn't exist. I just haven't. I, I certainly have heard of, um, for instance, I know that um, with New York Life, as I recall, there were um, people who were connected uh, to New York Life, board members, et cetera, 
who were abolitionists, who were opposed um, to the uh, slavery and the slave trade and all of that. Um, and so it's, it's a very good question and I don't have an answer to it. Um, but, you know, obviously, even, in, even within uh, this period of time when um, the economy was North and South was dominated by, um, you know, and uh, money to plantations, there were people who, who, white people who felt morally that this was wrong. Um, but it's a good question and I, I'd be curious myself. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned a few times your own shock at mm -hmm. never having learned this in school um, and, and talking about how important it is that we are aware of um, these aspects of American history. And I'm curious, um, we're curious to hear a little bit about how you would suggest um, teaching this to children. Um, we recently had a, an event uh, which spoke to history teachers from Jewish day schools in our area, asking this question about how we're teaching history to our children now. Um, and I'm curious to hear your perspective. Um, how can we bring these stories um, to, to our children? I think it's an excellent question. I think of it myself, I have children, you know, and they are not learning it, <laughs> so I have to tell you right now, just in the like 1840s and 1850s, and I'm like, I got some readings for you. Um, you know, it's tough. It's tough. I, I actually, uh, there, there have been times when I thought to myself, you know, if I really wanted to have impact, I would write, I would get involved in writing textbooks. Um, uh, that's what I would do. Um, but, you know, the truth is that the information is out there, um, and um more and more um, is out there. Um, and I wish I had um, a one-stop shopping, you know, um, resource list. Um, and, and I don't, I mean, with my own classes um, at NYU, I, I try to infuse them with some readings that I think are particularly helpful and interesting. Um, I've shared some with you. One, one thing which I didn't share and I forgot until today, which I think is wonderful actually for, I, would, I mean, highly, highly, is called Seeing White. It's a podcast. So it's kind of another medium, which is a lot of people enjoy. Um, and, um, it really explores kind of the origins of, um, you know, how race was constructed in, in America. And, and from, from, you know, the 1600s um, on, and it's a really uh, powerful and accessible, easily accessible way to get at some of this. Um, so I, I really suggest it for everyone. Great. I'll make sure to add that in the follow-up yeah. to the readings you suggest. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. People can access that more. Yeah. Better. And different too, you know, you can listen in the car. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask a few questions that all feel very related to me that um, they were asked separately, but they feel very intertwined. Um, so I'll start from the most narrow. Um, if they all have to do with kind of how people have reacted to um, to the research that you've done and to the articles you've published. So on the most narrow end, um, how did um, former First Lady Michelle Obama react to learning these details about her ancestry? In particular, I think of concern to, you know, a congregation of Jews, uh, but to the particular Jewish ties that, um, that, were, that were connected to her past. Um, and thinking a little bit more globally, how do how did the people who you were in contact with um, react to hearing about their ancestors' um, enslavement or act, like act of enslaving right. others? Mm -hmm. And then even more broadly, how have um, members of the Black community um, reacted or just, just at large, what, what has the reaction to your work been? Yeah. So um, for Mrs. Obama, it was... It was news, you know, this was news to her, it was news to her family. Um, you know, I inter for my book, I interviewed um, members of her family. And so I, um, you know, I kept them up to, you know, I, I let them know um, what I found before, you know, the book came out, let her know too. Um, and, you know, 
I think that I, and so I know that, you know, she shared um, some of the stories, um, the first article uh, with family um, at, at Thanksgiving at the White House, which is cool. Um, members of her family asked for signed copies of the book. So I think it was meaningful to them, which is, which is nice. I mean, I think, um, you know, an interesting thing about this, um, you know, for um, African Americans is that, you know, this is, it's, it's painful history, obviously, but because of kind of the time, right? So forced illiteracy, you know, it was illegal to able to read or write. So from that, from that period of time, there's so little, you know, they're not letters to Irish journals. We couldn't, I mean, very few. Um, so to be, and, 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 and then the government didn't record names. Black people do not, if you if enslaved people did not appear with their full names in the census. Um, and so many of those people only appear in government documents in 1870 and so, before then, there's nothing. So it's enormously meaningful for people. For um, Mrs. Obama's white ancestors, um, white ancestors or, or white cousins, um, you know, a real mix of emotions. Um, I think some of those interviews were, you know, among you know the most challenging that I've had. You know, I, I think, you know, as a journalist, you know we often we, do, we view ourselves as kind of apart from the story i'm reporting on this I'm, I'm writing about this you know it's not about me i it's but you know they looked at me and and saw a black woman with maybe this history too right and i'm asking for their family stories i'm asking for their photos i'm asking for their dna and and and, and you know and 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 for for them the, you know these people even though they didn't know about the slave owning part of the family, some of these people were known to them. They were revered people in their families. And this knowledge was both kind of enormously unsettling. And then the fear about would I treat their people fairly? You know, that was a real thing for them. Um, and um, I promised that I would, I did. Um, I think for the institutions, um, it's interesting, you know, some institutions um, have, uh, you know, uh, even in, even in, even in uh, the 21st century, even in 2018, 2019, most companies aren't really happy if I'm calling up and saying, hey, by the way, I think there's some records that show something, you know, they're not, that's not something that people are eagerly looking for. But, you know, the truth is that, you know, more and more um, uh, institutions are are doing this work, and Georgetown, you know, started this work on its own. You know, they um, got started and set up a committee, a faculty committee, to to look at this history when they um, uh, had renovated some buildings that were named after two early presidents uh, who. Um, were involved in this sale and, and they knew it was gonna come up. So I think people are trying to grapple, trying to grapple with it. Yeah, a lot of people aren't though, but some people are. <laughs> so um, I, I'll i start this question just by couching it a little bit, if I may, in my own personal experience um, of pre-reading the suggested readings you gave us, which I just posted in the chat mm -hmm. and will be sent in the follow-up email. So the first two articles were articles you wrote about, particularly about the um, the Jesuit priests, and then there was one um, which I don't know is in there, but about the nuns that you mentioned who owned who owned slaves, and then the last article which you also have alluded to um, is from the Forward, and it outlines um, Jewish slave ownership in Charleston, and that was the hardest one for me to read because I, as a person as a you know committed Jew, I I believe it is against the tenets of my religion to to um, to treat people in this way. It was it was a hard thing for me to face in, in my own faith tradition. And you mentioned that you're Catholic and you chose to write these stories about Catholic institutions. And um, one of our participants has asked um, how, if you feel comfortable speaking about it, how this research and this learning has impacted your relationship with, uh, with your faith and, and with the Catholic church um, and why you think uh, people have, so many black people have stayed Catholic and have continued to participate um, in, in a church and an institution that, um, that has, you know, treated them and 
Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic, you know, prior to pandemic, I was a every Sunday at church Catholic. Um, and so I was kind of, you know, and, and I come from, you know, my mother's family is very Catholic. So I, I was astonished, really astonished. At the same time, I have to say that um, it, 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 it didn't affect um, my faith. It really didn't. I mean, for me, it was kind of the frailty of man um, and um, and priests. Uh, and, and Lord knows, um, you know, if I'm still Catholic, given all that we've had, we've had some other issues. <laughs> so it's not like that's the only one. Um, I, I um, you know, it, it speaks to, I think, the frailty of human beings and the importance of, you um, you know, being really true to what we believe and what we say we believe. Um, so it hasn't, it hasn't shaken my faith. I do, I do, I, I feel, I, I, I wish the church talked more about this. I wish in, in, in terms of like, if I was, if I was to be critical, I think that's where I would be. I was like, you know, this is, this is foundational for the Catholic church and it's almost impossible to like where would you find it if you were to look it's just not anywhere like in any of the organizations where they talk about their history it's just not there and I feel like that's that's problem that troubles me that troubles me but again I'm a black woman in America there that's that's a lot of what's around but but as a Catholic I feel like and this is my work so <laughs> people should know well, thank you for teaching us and thank you for sharing with us. And I, I hope um, that it sparks more conversation and introspection on our part um, to think about our relationship with American history, our relationship with our own histories and our relationship with our faith. So thank you so, so much um, for being here with us. Um, I wanted to just take a brief moment um, before we pause and um, go into breakout sessions or, or exit to just let us know about some, uh, some upcoming events, some things to look forward to. Um, our next event is going to be on February 18th on next not this Thursday evening, the following Thursday evening. Um, it is titled Four Questions People Ask About Racism and Anti-Semitism. And it's going to be a dialogue, a conversation between Clint Odom of the National Urban League and um, the Jewish Center's own uh, Sefi Kogan of the AJC of the American Jewish Committee in conversation with one another. Um, so that's going to be um, next Thursday. And also for those of you um, with young children, the Jewish Center is going to be launching Yoval Youth uh, very shortly. So stay tuned for more information about the age appropriate um, developmentally targeted sessions we're going to be um, running for our youth um, and the, in conversation and in partnership with, with our parents. Um, so stay tuned. Please continue coming to future Yoval events. Um, and really just thank you again, um, Ms. Barnes, for, for teaching us so, so generously. Um, we really, we really enjoyed. Um, if you would like to stay for processing groups, please hang on. Um, it's going to take us a few minutes to get everyone sent to where they, where they belong. Um, and in the meantime, um, thank you again and have a, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.